In this lecture, I want to make some general points about macroeconomic models. Um, some of this, for some of you, may seem a little bit basic, but I think there are some sort of fundamental ideas about sort of what a model is and how one works with a model that, that people often get uh, tripped up on. So I think it's worth taking a little time to sort of walk through very explicitly, you know, what what we're doing when we're when we're using a model and some of some of the sort of building blocks of models that people people do sometimes get confused about. So obviously we're starting here. We're we're in a class on macroeconomics, and that um, you know means means the study of the economy as a whole, uh, which is 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 not you know obviously a distinct thing that one one could do in economics. It's not obvious that there's there's some special special um, body of knowledge that applies to economies as a whole. Um, in some sense, of course, we have the idea of the economy as an object of inquiry going back to wherever we want to date the beginning of economics to, but not necessarily the idea that the, the question of, of sort of the, the overall behavior of the economy requires a different set of tools than the, the behavior of the individual units that make up that economy. In fact, sort of the, the body of thought that we, we call macroeconomics really comes into being with uh, Keynes in the 1930s. Now, you know, again, people certainly, you know, whether we're talking about, um, you know, Marx or, or, or Ricardo or Kenai or whoever, you know, had, had visions of a distinct set of dynamics that, 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 that operated at the level of the economy as a whole um, that couldn't just be reduced to the individual uh, units in that economy. But those are not the basis of what we think of as, as macroeconomics today. The language, the concepts, the terms, the, the basic framework that we model in really, really go back to, to Keynes as opposed to, you know, those earlier writers um, and, and go back to the specific historical context in which Keynes was writing, uh, you know, first the Depression and then World War II. So the starting point here is, is again, that we do have a distinct set of relationships that we need to think about when we're dealing with an entire economy that we wouldn't need in, if we were looking at some individual um, piece of it. And that's important when we ask, what is a macroeconomic question? What is a macroeconomic topic? We're really things, things, things that, 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 that we can observe or describe at the, at, the, at the level of an entire economy. So a story about you know, how an individual company might behave or what you know, is going on in a particular industry or what explains, you know, why some people get higher wages than other people. A lot of very important questions that we might want to ask in economics really don't fall under the, the scope of macroeconomics. With macroeconomics, we really, we really need to be talking about um, statements that we make about an entire economy or, or things that we measure at the level of an entire economy. Um, if, if you're talking about something that isn't that, then, then, then you sort of move beyond the domain of macroeconomics. Um, now, a sort of corollary of this is that we do, in fact, have natural units that we can regard as entire economies out in the world. And so a kind of implicit premise of, of most sort of work in macroeconomics is that a national economy can reasonably be thought of as, as a complete self-contained system. Now, obviously, in some cases, that really, really doesn't make any sense at all. If you're talking about a, a small country that's very tightly integrated with, you know, its, its neighbors and trade partners, and it's not clear that there is even a, a sort of distinct set of macroeconomic questions that you would ask for that particular country. And maybe for a lot of, for instance, macroeconomic topics, the appropriate unit might be, you know, the European Union, as opposed to its constituent countries. Or we might say that even today, actually, a lot of national borders are, are actually quite important for enough enough of what's going on you know economically that we can still but in any case we, we really because our statistics our measurements and our, our policy choices continue to be made at the national level the relevance of macroeconomics comes from the fact that we can identify processes that are taking place within a particular set of borders as in some sense being a, a self-contained system and you know there's a lot of obviously issues around that that we we want to think about we don't want to adopt that assumption uncritically but in some sense the way we do macroeconomics depends on us thinking that that's a, a at least a reasonable starting point um, and then related to this is the notion that there are interesting or important choices that can be made at the level of the economy as a whole that the, the national economy is, is a distinct object, not just of inquiry and understanding, but of policy. Um, 
the reason, you know, that the, the, the great motivation of, of the vast majority of macroeconomic scholarship and also macroeconomic debate is, is to come with, up with some view about what national governments ought to do. That the question is, you know, where should the central bank set the interest rate under its control? Well, for a certain period in the relatively recent past, it seemed like that was the only question in macroeconomics, or at least sort of the overwhelmingly dominant one. Uh, fortunately, the conversation has gotten a little more interesting uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, but yeah, you know, questions about trade policy, questions about, you know, the appropriate level of growth to pursue, about, uh, you know, um, policies around national targets like, like uh, the trade balance or uh, the inflation rate, about taxes, uh, you know, these, these sorts of questions are kind of integral to the development of macroeconomics. The, the, the interest of, of thinking about the economy as a whole is because you think you might be able to do something to the economy as a whole. And so the emergence of macroeconomics as a distinct body of thought really goes hand in hand with the emergence of the economy as, as a more active object of policy. And again, in particular, that means first, you know, the experience of the Great Depression where, where the notion that you could sort of leave the private market economy to its own devices really became not politically sustainable. And then World War II, where there was a need to, to, to mobilize sort of the maximum amount of resources from the national economy and to reshape the national economy in a way that, that, that met the needs of the war. And then, you know, on an ongoing basis, the, the notion that there is a real role for the, the state in shaping the economy is, is sort of goes hand in hand with the notion that the, the economy is something that we want to understand and the particular causal linkages that make up the economy are something we need to understand. So um, when we talk about macroeconomics, and here I think it's important, again, to just make some distinctions clear that we don't always, we don't always make explicit. There's a lot of different kinds of thinking that fall under the heading of macroeconomics. Um, there is macroeconomic policy questions like I was just talking about. There's also, you know, macroeconomic forecasting, which is, you know, an application that's often more important for private businesses, but it's something we see, you know, play a big role in, in, in public debate as well. You know, there was a big kerfuffle just uh, earlier this week about uh, the Congressional Budget Office issuing some new forecasts for, you know, where they thought that the level of economic growth was gonna be relative to potential. So, so this question of trying to make some prediction about the economy as a whole. Um, macroeconomic history, that the, that the economy as a whole is an object that has evolved over time and we can ask historical questions about that. And that a specific but very important um, uh, sort of body of knowledge that falls under the broad umbrella of macroeconomics, which is national accounting, which is the whole uh, really enormous system of, of measurement, record keeping, accounting, that we use to produce any sort of usable quantitative information about an economy as a whole. So all of these things are sort of distinct, distinct sets of questions, distinct conversations that take place within that broad umbrella of macroeconomics. Um, but then we have, you know, a couple of more, more specific pieces that we tend to focus on in the classroom. So first of all, we, we want to be able to describe in, in a useful way the, the, the behavior of this, this, this entire system. And the way we do that is by reducing it to a relatively small number of uh, variables, which we call aggregates. An aggregate meaning simply a variable or an outcome. Let's not say variable. I shouldn't have used that word because I'm going to distinguish a variable for an aggregate in a moment. And an aggregate, uh, an outcome that we have some procedure for measuring at the level of the economy as a whole. So we have, for instance, some ideas about what's going on uh, in, in employment, in the labor market, and there's a lot of things going on. People working more or fewer hours, getting hired, not getting hired, entering into relationships that are sort of like being hired, but not exactly like being hired. And a lot of, a lot of these sort of relationships that involve getting paid or not, involve doing useful work or not, involve having a boss or not, uh, we have to somehow summarize those. And so we come up with some kind of measurement, for instance, unemployment rate. There's a whole process of turning all of this disparate stuff into a single number. And these, these single numbers are, are aggregate. So we, we try to describe all the complexity of the system using a relatively small number of numbers where we have a, an agreed upon procedure for, 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 for you know, deciding what that number is going to be. I, I, I don't necessarily want to say measurement because in some cases it's not clear that the object is out there to be measured. Rather, we've, we've chosen, established some convention for producing a number as a, as a description of something that may not exist in a quantifiable way until we, we decide to put a number on it. So these are our aggregates. You know, the major aggregates that we talk about here are 
you know, GDP, for instance, the unemployment rate, as I mentioned, CPI measuring the price level, things like the trade balance, uh, the share of the to total amount of wage payments in the economy. There's, there's, there's a bunch of them. And we'll, in some ways, the course will sort of be organized, at least in, in part, kind of walking through one of these major aggregates after another. But this is, this is sort of the, the building block of, of a lot of our, uh, as soon as we want to get more, more, more precise with our, our macroeconomic thinking, we have, to, we have to be able to reframe our arguments in terms of, uh, you know, this, this, these relatively small number of measurements, these aggregates. Now, when we start talking about these things, we, we may then decide to, to develop our ideas into macroeconomic theory. So I think, again, it's important to distinguish theory from, from the sort of broader conversation. Um, as soon as we start doing theory, we're going from the aggregates, which are the things we actually have some procedure to measure, to a variable, which is a sort of quantity, an abstract quantity that we're going to make arguments about that we think corresponds in some way to those observable aggregates and then behind them in some way to the sub substantive thing that we actually care about. But the variable is not the aggregate and it's, it's not the, the substantive thing going on in the economy. It's a number that we, 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 we've decided, a, a, a symbol that we've decided we're going to manipulate to see, to see what kind of stories we can tell with it, what kind of conclusions logically we can draw from it um, that we, we hope or believe corresponds to the actual thing that we're interested in. But we should always keep in mind a variable is not an aggregate. The aggregate is the thing we measure. The variable is the thing that we, we stick into a model and try to manipulate. And they're never, they're never the same thing. Um, often when it comes to models, we don't worry too much about the specific measurement procedure. So in our model, we'll have a level of output, which we call Y, we assume it corresponds to GDP, but when we measure GDP, there's a lot of specific issues about what gets counted and what doesn't that we don't worry about when we're, we're, we're making a, a model. We just have this number Y and we have a few relationships that we think uh, you know, are relevant for it. So the variable is the thing in the model, the aggregate is the thing we're measuring out in the world. Uh, and then our, 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 theory, our theory is then gonna involve postulating, describing, imagining a certain set of causal relationships between our variables. When this happens, that happens. When this changes by so much, that has to change by so much. These two things have to move in a certain way together. We have some sort of causal structure linking up our variables. Now we can go a step beyond that and turn our, our causal story into a model by formalizing those relationships. I can have a theory which says, um, you know, the unemployment rate is, is really dependent on the rate of economic growth. My theory is that when growth accelerates, unemployment goes down. When growth slows, unemployment goes up. To turn that, to go the step from that theory to a model, I have to, I have to put some kind of exact relationship there. I can put numbers on it, or even if I don't put numbers on it, I have to at least specify the form of that relationship. Is it, are we imagining, you know, high, uh, growth is going to lead to a steadily rising unemployment rate, or is a higher level of growth going to just correspond to a lower level of unemployment? When you formalize a, a theory, you're, 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 you're actually making sort of a specific set of mathematical relationships for the, for the general causal story you were telling before. You have to give an exact form to the relationships you're describing. And then the second thing you're doing when you go from a theory to a model when I lay out a theory, I'm, I'm leaving open the possibility that there are lots of other things going on in the world. When I write a model, I'm, I'm, I'm describing a complete system. It's like a little toy train set. And what's in the model, as far as the model is concerned, is all of there is. So when you go from a theory to a model, in the first case, first place, you're, you're making exact quantifiable um, statements about the relationships, the causal relationships you're interested in. And secondly, you're, you're, you're laying out a system in which those are the only relationships that there are. It's a hypothetical model is sort of a hypothetical system in which the particular relationships that you're interested in between your variables are all the relationships there are. And then because of that, because of those two factors, you can then give an exact description of what happens in the model. Because on the one hand, you've given all your relationships a precise form. And on the other hand, you've said you're not going to pay attention to anything else. You can now give an exact answer to what happens in one place when something changes over here. That's obviously an attractive feature of a model in many ways, but it also comes at a cost because we, uh, you know, may not have the kind of knowledge that would give us any confidence that we can really take a relationship in, and give it an exact quantifiable form, even if we think that the relationship is real. And we know perfectly well there are lots of other things going on in the world that we didn't 
refer to in that particular theory. So as people say, you know, a model is never true. There's no such thing as a true model. All models are false because all models are, are, are more precise than, than any kind of real knowledge we can have in the world. And they are uh, abstracting away from lots of things that we know are important in the world. So the question we ask about a model is not, is it true, but is it useful? Is, is the specific relationships that it focuses our attention on, are they reliable enough as guides to the stuff we can actually observe and influence that, um, that, 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 it, that it points to some regularities we can actually rely on in the world, whether we're trying to predict what's gonna happen concretely or if we've got imagining ourselves as policymakers, you know, influence it or control it. So, okay, so we've got a model of some kind, meaning exact quantifiable relationships where we, we've excluded everything else. We can express this in a couple of ways. We can express it as a system of equations or just as equivalently, we can express it uh, graphically with, with, with a set of lines um, on one or, one or more figures. And I think one thing, again, that it's important to understand, and, and again, to some of you, this is obvious, but I, I found teaching this that it's not always obvious. So I wanna spell it out, is that the equation and the figure are exactly the same thing. If I write A equals three B, or if I, and these are just in this case, completely abstract, these variables don't refer to anything. They don't have any correspondence to anything. They're just variables, but I'm just, just to make this point, if I write the equation A equals three B, or I draw this upward sloping line here, that's the same statement. These are exactly equivalent. They're, they're, they're perfectly interchangeable for every purpose. These two things, you know, this equation, this graph are saying the exact same thing. And it's, it's just a, purely a matter of convenience, which representation you use. So one of the, the initial skills, you know, that, that you acquire before anything else, when you're, you know, working with this stuff is to be able to translate back and forth between a, a graphical representation and a representation in terms of equations without, um, you know, based on, on whatever is more convenient or whatever, uh, you know, allows you to reach the kind of conclusions that you're interested in. And they each, they each have their advantages, um, uh, but they're always, they're, they're strictly equivalent. Any, any figure you can draw, you can, you can write down a corresponding set of equations. Any equation you write, you can draw one or more figures. Uh, so now normally we're going to have um, uh, a number of different relationships in our model. Um, so, uh, and we're going to also have these things being interpreted causally in some fashion. Um, our story is, is, is almost always going to involve some kind of story about something happening and something else happening as a result. So we're gonna have some variables that are that we think changes of them are determining other ones. In an equation, it's conventional to put have causality run from right to left. Your independent variable, the thing that's changing on its own is on the right. Your dependent variable, the thing that's changing as a result is on the left. And of course, in a figure, it's conventional to have the causal uh, story run from the x-axis to the y-axis, the thing that's changing on its own is represented on the x-axis. The thing that's changing as a result is on the y-axis. You can't always do that. For instance, you might have a figure with two different lines on it representing causal stories going in opposite directions. So you're not gonna be able to have them both uh, represented that way, but that's the convention when we can do it. Um, we may sometimes think of variables as influencing each other, being jointly determined. Um, so neither one is, is um, causally prior to the other. And I should say as a style of modeling, this sort of what we think of as the sort of neoclassical models tend to say that one of the, want to think of the observable aggregates in the world is all being jointly determined by unobservable stuff happening behind them. So price doesn't cause quantity, quantity doesn't cause price. There's, there's these unobservable supply and demand functions that are interacting to produce these. One of the sort of distinctive features of a Keynesian style of modeling is that it tends to have a more clean causal structure running between aggregates. Output determines employment, investment determines output. It's a, it's a one-way one -way line between these observable aggregates. It's a different style of modeling and it's not always, always that way. But in any case, whether, whether we've got a, a clear causal story from one aggregate to another, or whether we've got some story where they're being jointly determined by things that we can't directly observe, we've got some kind of causal story in our head when we're making a model. Now, if we're representing a model using variables and variables are supposed to be quantities, then they're gonna have units of some kind or they can have units and then it's important that the units be consistent. And of course, as soon as we're moving back from our model to the observable world, back to our aggregates, 
then the question of units becomes very important. Uh, so it's always something to think about whenever you're formulating a theory or, or reading a model, what are the units of these variables? We can have a level. The level is obviously where the thing is at the moment and that level may be measured in something, whether it's, you know, hours if we're measuring employment or dollars for many kinds of, you know, measure, you know economic quantities or, or something else. Um, but the level is, is where it is now. The change is, is the difference between this level and the last period's level, whenever that was. We might also look at a percentage change, um, the change divided by the previous value, or the rate of change, the change divided by the period of time over which it happened. If we've got a variable that's represented in uh, as a percent, then we have to be careful if we're describing a, a change in that variable, whether it's in terms of a percent of the percent or a percentage point change. Some variables are ratios, and then it becomes important to remember a ratio always has a numerator and a denominator, and a change in the ratio could, could be the result of either one. And in particular, one, one when again, in a purely abstract model, we don't worry a lot about this, but as soon as we're going to try to turn that back into a statement about observable data, the units become very important. And one in particular that I hope is familiar to, to you guys, but just, just um, you know, um, is, is, is logarithms, which are a very convenient way of um, working with a lot of data. Um, basically, if, if you've got a number, um, what you do is you express it as, as, the, as the power to which you would have to raise the, the natural logarithm e to get that number. If x equals e raised to the a power, then a is the natural log of x. The reason we use this um, in a lot of economic contexts, first of all, um, it's useful for converting a multiplicative relationship to an additive one. It turns a, a nonlinear relationship into a linear relationship. And in general, for both, both mathematically and especially if we're going to do any sort of statistical or econometric you know, work on the basis of our model, it's a lot easier to work with linear relationships than with uh, multiplicative ones. And sort of related to this, a convenient property of log values is that the, the difference between the logs is, is approximately the same as the percentage difference between the underlying values. So a, a, the difference in log points is, is, is going to be, it's not equal to, but it, but it should be roughly proportionate to the percentage difference between the underlying underlying values. So a change in logs can be thought of as a percentage increase. And again, a lot of economic variables we think of as changing in, in percent over time or between countries rather than, than differences in levels being meaningful. So, uh, but differences in levels are easier to work with. So, so this is something we're gonna see a lot of. Now, as we write down our, our um, a model in the form of an equation, you're gonna have basically three kinds of symbols in there. You're going to have endogenous variables, which means variables determined within the model. The model is telling us what values the endogenous variables will have. That's A model is basically a way of, of, of describing or predicting the behavior of, the, of, of its endogenous variables. Then you're going to have exogenous variables, which, which correspond. Both variables are supposed to correspond to something in the economy. We're imagining our variable is, in principle, some object out in the world that in principle we could observe and interact with in some way. So we're imagining it corresponding to output or employment or the price level or something. Our variables correspond to some object which in principle is observable out there in a real economy. The endogenous ones, as I say, are determined within the model. The exogenous ones are determined outside the model. We have to take them as given. It doesn't necessarily mean fixed or we might imagine our exogenous variables are changing in some way, but they're not being, the model doesn't tell you what the exogenous variables are. You just have to take the exogenous variables as, a, as an input to the model and then the model based on those values can tell you what the endogenous variables are going to do. And then finally in your model you have parameters. A parameter is, is a feature that only exists within the model. A parameter is different from a variable because a parameter does not even in principle, describe an object out in the world. A parameter is just a feature of the model itself, and it's a description of the relationship between the variables. We choose values for the parameters to make the model behave in what we think is an appropriate way. So if I think there's a relationship between economic growth and unemployment, I can write down an equation that I think describes that relationship. And then I'm gonna to have to put some parameters in there to say how much 
let's say, how much does unemployment fall if GDP grows by an additional point? So my parameter is, my, is, is, a, is a description of that relationship. It's not something you can ever directly measure in the world, although if you do statistical work based on a model, it's, it's typically the parameters of the model that you're trying to estimate. So the variables are, are not, on the other hand, measuring the actual values of the variables in isolation doesn't tell you anything about the model. The model is, is, is trying to describe what over time is going to be the relationship between, between these different variables. And as a part of that description, it uses a set of parameters. So when you're looking at a model, it's important to understand what are the, what are the variables in there, which are, are, are representing objects out in the economy, and what are the parameters, which are just features of the model that are, that are saying something about the, the, the relationship that it's describing or predicting between those variables. So um, now, Again, typically we represent a, um, a, uh, a model as a system of equations most frequently. And then we, we, we a, a useful bit of terminology, if it has exactly the same number of equations as it has endogenous variables, we say it's exactly determined or closed because as algebra, if you have the same number of unknown variables as equations, then there will be a unique solution. So in that case, the model is closed. It predicts a single outcome. And we often call that unique outcome consistent with the model, the equilibrium. If there's fewer equations than endogenous variables, we say the model is underdetermined. There are an infinite number of combinations of values that will be consistent with the model. Of course, there'll also be many more that are not consistent with the model that still has some content. But we say it's underdetermined. And a model with more equations than endogenous variables, we say is overdetermined. In general, there will be no values of the variables that will satisfy the model. So typically you can say if the model is overdetermined, you have to figure out what equation to take out or what variable to make endogenous. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to give a consistent uh, description of any possible you know, economy. Now within our model, we're gonna have equations. They said there's gonna be two types of equations, behavioral equations and accounting identities. Formally, if you're just approaching this thing as a math problem, it doesn't matter. You, you, you're looking for an exact solution. So you assume all of the equations hold exactly. That's, that's again, sort of what we're doing when we make a model. But as soon as we, we interpret our model as a description of a real economy, it makes a difference if we're looking at a behavioral equation or an accounting identity. A behavioral equation is supposed to be a substantive claim about the system it describes. It says something about what we expect to actually happen in terms of the behavior of the economy. Um, and therefore, the behavioral equation is never going to hold exactly. It's, it should be a reasonable approximation in the context we're using this model for. Um, an accounting identity, on the other hand, is true by definition because of the way the variables in it are defined. So accounting identities will always hold exactly. Um, but in itself, that doesn't tell us anything because we, we designed the variables to, to in that way. We've defined, so for instance, we conventionally defined labor productivity as total output divided by total employment. So if we go out and measure output and employment and productivity, we're always gonna find that that equation is satisfied because there really is not, labor productivity is not a separate variable here. It's just, it's just, it's just being defined as, as the, um, the ratio of output to employment. Now, in the real world, often, if you're not actually, you, depending on how you measure things, your accounting identity may seem not to hold exactly. Um, and in that case, there's always going to be some kind of um, uh, some some kind of adjusting term that will uh, that will that will ensure your identity is actually satisfied. Even in in many cases, you know, um, where you've got an accounting relationship, but the items in it are being measured from from different places, then there's going to be an item in there called like errors and omissions or something, which is just it 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 just reflects the fact that this identity ought to hold, but in our, in our, because of our observations and whatever noise or imperfections in our observations, it's not holding. So you add another kind of residual term in there to, 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 to make, make the accounting work. But one way or another, when you've got an accounting identity, it should hold always exactly. Behavioral equations, on the other hand, are descriptions, which may or may not be reasonably accurate and are never perfectly accurate. So again, let's come back to this relationship between unemployment and uh, growth. The, the very um, familiar, well, if it's not familiar yet, it's probably getting that way and it will become more so, um, 
equation that we use to describe that is Oken's law, which says that the change in the unemployment rate is a function of the growth of output. Uh, delta meaning change, U for the unemployment rate, G is growth, and A and B are parameters. So what we actually can observe in the world is the unemployment rate and its, its rate of change and the rate of real growth, although real being more than a little bit problematic, but we have some procedure for, for trying to measure this thing. A and B are not objects that exist in the world. They're just, we set these parameters at a level that makes this equation a, a good description of the behavior of the, of the actual variables in it. So for the US, we might choose, you know, 0.5 for A and two for B, and that, that gives us a reasonably accurate description of, of the historical variation in, or joint variation in unemployment and growth. Um, so if the model is, 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 if we think of both these things as endogenous, the model is underdetermined. It's telling us there's a line and we'll expect to see, you know, growth and unemployment somewhere along the, that line, but it doesn't tell us where. Um, lots of combinations of, of change in unemployment and growth rates will satisfy that. It, you know, zero growth and a one point rise in unemployment would work. Two, two points uh, real growth and no change in, in the unemployment rate would work or, or many other combinations. So by itself, if those are both endogenous, underdetermined. On the other hand, if we say growth is exogenous, then this model predicts a definite value for the change in unemployment. And that's that's more often, and this single equation is, is a perfectly valid model. There's no requirement that models be complex. Um, and then it becomes a model of the determination of the unemployment or the change in the unemployment rate. Um, for any given growth rate, it, it predicts a definite change in the unemployment rate. Now we sometimes write our exogenous variables with a bar over them if, if it's ambiguous, which is, which is exogenous. A lot of times it's clear from the context. Um, so we can draw this graph. This graph, again, has the exact same content as the equation. Uh, it's, 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 this is the same, same thing as the equation. There's no difference. It's just, it's just a different way of writing the exact same relationship. Uh, now, since this is a behavioral um, equation, what it amounts to is a prediction that over time, most of our observations of the real growth rate and the change in the unemployment rate will be somewhere near this line. That's what the line is saying. Most of the time, the situation of the real economy will, will be someplace relatively close to this line. Now, and this again is something that the people do get tripped up on. When we're interpreting something like this, the thing we have to keep in mind, if, if we've got a graph where, where some, we've got some observable aggregate on each axis, then each point in that space represents a, a, a situation the economy could be in, a state the economy could be in. At any given moment, any, any real economy where we can measure these things is gonna occupy some point in this space. So we might say, you know, in, in 2009, you know, the U.S. economy was up here. In, in 1999, the U.S. economy was down here and so on. But at any given, if we were say looking at the U.S. at any given year, we could put it somewhere in this space. So a situation in the economy we would represent as a single point in this space. Then something happening in a, in a particular concrete moment, a development in the economy, we would represent as a movement within this space. So if you say, what happens when there's a recession? Well, growth, declines, unemployment goes up. So we move up and to the left here. If there's a boom, maybe growth accelerates and unemployment falls. So we move down towards the right here. Now notice again, talk about um, units. This is a relationship between the rate of growth and the change in the unemployment rate. So neither of these variables are, are totally straightforward, but, but it would be a different relationship if we you know, had different, different units, that the units are part of, 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 the, of what we're doing. Um, so if you're talking about a, a moment in time, you're talking about a point within this space. If you're talking about an event, a development over some period of time, you're talking about a movement within this space. The line then, the line is telling us about a pattern we expect to see over an extended period of time, or perhaps over a number of different units in space, you know, places in space perhaps, but a pattern, if we observe this, this, these variables many times, we expect to see a pattern where most of those observations, the pairs of values are going to fall near this line. So it wouldn't make any sense to talk about it, to describe a given moment in an economy in terms of the slope or the position of this line. And it wouldn't make sense to describe 
what happens in a recession as a change in this line. E basically, you could say each, each very form of this line you could draw, how high it is, how sloped it is, represents a different economy. Now, of course, over long periods of time, you know, the economy changes, so the line can change. But a different slope or position of the line represents um, something that, that sort of necessarily happens over a much longer period of time than the changes in the variables. The line, the, the only reason the line makes sense, the only reason the equation makes sense, the only way it can be useful is if we imagine there's a long period where unemployment and the growth rate go up and down, but the relationship between them is relatively stable. The only way this thing makes sense is if we think the relationship between these variables is more stable than the variables themselves. If, if, you, don't, if you don't think something like that, then, then this is not a, a useful model and you, shouldn't, you, you should throw it out. Uh, so over some long period of time, like a question we might ask, does, is the US today, is this relationship similar to what it was in the 1950s? Or we might ask, does this relationship look the same in the US as it does in Japan? But when we're talking about a difference in the slope of the line or the position of the line, which is exactly the same as talking about a different set of values for the parameters, we're talking about a difference between two different economies, not something that, that would happen in a, in a, in a you know, short period of time within a given economy. Um, something I think people often, often get confused about when they start trying to manipulate these things. Now we don't always have to use these types of formal models. We can we can talk about our theories without formalizing them that way. And often it's it's even easier and simpler. So I don't need to write an equation or draw a figure for Oaken's law. I could just do a simple little flow chart with a with an arrow pointing from y for output to u for unemployment. I can put a little negative sign uh, in the middle to show that this is a negative relationship. And I, I think in many contexts this is this is actually tells you everything you need to know. And we'll, we'll be making plenty of use of uh, flowcharts like that during this class. In fact, I've already showed you a bunch of them. So, so now this is not exactly the same as the equation of the figure because this doesn't give us the quantitative information. It doesn't tell us how much unemployment changes in response to a change in output. In, in, the, in the way it's drawn here, it doesn't even tell you what the units are, although you could put you know, growth over here and change in the unemployment rate over here. But it, does, it certainly isn't quantifiable, and you can't uh, solve. You can't use it to solve. You can't find an exact solution. It's just telling you the general direction that we expect um, this relationship to operate in. So there's there's advantages to both. The formal model, as I say, allows us to 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 be more precise. If we have enough data that we can confidently say one point of additional growth for one year is going to lead to a half point fall in the unemployment rate, it's useful to write that down in an equation. That, that, that additional information is not just a negative relationship, but, but it actually is this specific magnitude that we'd like to be able to describe that. And it also allows us to calculate a unique equilibrium. If we've got several equations, there may be exactly one combination of endogenous variables that will satisfy them. So we can calculate a unique outcome for the system, whereas the flowchart, again, just gives us a sort of general description of the directions of influence. On the other hand, the flowchart becomes more attractive if we've got a lot of relationships that we need to think about at the same time where a system of equations or, or lines on, on now multiple graphs quickly gets rather unwieldy. It explicitly shows the direction of causality, which again, you know, becomes more important as we've got more relationships to worry about. And it's better suited for describing a process happening over time. The equation or the graph just shows us a unique relationship between these variables. If we, if we have, want to be able to think more in terms of something happening and then something else happening and then something else happening. It's, it's, it's harder to do that with a system of equations or with the sort of figures that we normally use in economics. And then of course, it's also the case that many in many cases, we actually don't really have the knowledge to quantify our relationships. And we're not sure if it's a good idea to abstract away from all the others. And so sort of having a lot of general relationships on a flow chart gives us a better sense of, of the bigger picture than trying to give a more precise uh, content to a, a small number of relationships. So finally, um, one of the biggest challenges, one of the things that I think people struggle with the most in, in macroeconomics is moving between the abstractions, the model, the theory, and developments in real economies. And, and there's no real trick or technique to doing this. It's, it's something you have to practice and learn, but it's, you should be conscious that this is 
a critical skill to be practicing, that to go from a, 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 a description of something that you might hear in a policy debate or in a newspaper and to be able to turn that into a representation within an appropriate model or conversely to take a model and think about what it's actually saying about a possible real world situation. It's not, it's not straightforward. The terms in our models don't, don't exist to objectively existing material objects. There's nothing out there that actually corresponds to output or consumption or employment. Uh, we have, you know, a set of, we have concrete activities. Somebody goes to work, somebody puts up a building, records a lecture, whatever they're doing, um, uh, you know, they, they collect a paycheck. Um, we try to aggregate all this stuff up into a relatively small number of our observable aggregates. And then we hope that there's some reasonable correspondence between the aggregates as we've defined and, and calculated them and the variables in our theory. But there's a lot of, a lot of potential slips, a lot that can go wrong at each step here. So, so you have to actually be conscious of and, and really be thinking about the thing over here, how much does it correspond to the thing over here? And which thing over here does it actually correspond to and for what purposes? It's not, it's not straightforward. And you also, when you're doing a formal model, you obviously isolated a relatively small number of the causal relationships that, that we know exist in the world. So you have to ask, is this the relevant set of causal relationships for the question that I'm interested in? Have I assumed something or said something as exogenous that actually I need to be thinking about how it's changing in this situation? So the, the back and forth between the sort of concrete questions we're interested in and, and the formal representations of economic models and the sort of economic theory and aggregates that fall in between there, and maybe I should have added theory as another term between aggregates and, and, and or I should have added models over here. Anyway, the, the, that's, that's never trivial and it's something you have to think about, uh, you know, and it's one of the most important skills in working with this stuff. So yeah. Um, so I'm going to end with a couple of quotes. I, I like these quotes, so some of you have probably seen them before. But uh, so this is, is Trig V. Havelmel, um, who is really the inventor or one of the originators of, of modern econometrics, for which he, he got the Nobel Prize. Very interesting guy. He says, uh, there is hardly an economist who feels really happy about identifying the current series of national income, consumption, et cetera, with the variable, variables by those names in his theories. Or conversely, he would think it too complicated or perhaps uninteresting to try to build models whose variables would correspond to those actually given by current economic statistics. The practical conclusion is the advice that economists ever fail to give, but that few actually follow, that one should study very carefully the actual series considered and the conditions under which they were produced before identifying them with the variables of a particular theoretical model. And that is good advice and, and uh, we, should, we should strive to follow it. So it's one of the things that I wanna do in this semester is, um, and it's actually, I've, I've rearranged the course a little bit last year, last couple of years, I, I really did more theory and I've, I've decided that we should actually take Havamo's advice here and, and, and think carefully about these things, aggregates that we're measuring, how are they actually defined and measured and do they correspond to the thing that we, we, we think we're talking about when we, when we do theory. You know, I, I think I, I used to joke, you know, you should really think of macroeconomics as the study of the social process that causes a national accountant to enter one number rather than another one in the spreadsheet, which would probably be pushing things too far to the other side. But there is, there is a sense in which the object we're studying in macroeconomics is not the economy, but these aggregate representations of the economy created by um, our national accounting systems. And we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. And then, um, on sort of the other point, this is John Maynard Keynes, of course. Um, he says, um, this is a quote from the general theory, uh, actually, um, uh, where he's, he's, it's a quote from the general theory where he's explaining why his exposition is mostly um, verbal, although I haven't really, he says, he's basically, he's got a passage where he says, you know, he's, he's choosing to, to, to mostly have a verbal style of exposition rather than formalizing things in equations. Precisely, he says, because when you write up equations, you, you're abstracting away from many of the relationships you know exist in the real world, but it's hard to keep all of those partial derivatives in the back of your head. Whereas when you describe something, it's, it's easier to remember that this is, this is a partial description and that you have to be ready to bring in new elements as soon as they become relevant. Anyway, he says here, he goes on, he says, economics is a way of thinking in terms of models joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world not to provide a machine or method of blind manipulation, which will furnish an infallible answer, but to provide ourselves with an organized and orderly method of thinking about particular problems. 
And I think, I think again, that's, that's very good advice as we work with models. These are not true descriptions of the world and we shouldn't expect them to give us precise answers. They're tools for thinking in a more logical, orderly way about particular problems. And so the question about any economic model is always what is the particular problem for which this is relevant? 